Okay, uh, so we are going to continue with uh, a number of algebraic issues and definitions. Um, so the last thing I did, well, some of the last things we did was we talked about eigenvalue problems. So that's a typical eigenvalue problem. In particular, quite often, we are interested in symmetric um, tensors A. Uh, for which we have mentioned that the eigenvalues are real and the eigenvectors form a basis actually. So with respect to that basis then the tensor admits a simple representation which is called the spectral decomposition. And then you can easily express also the three invariants of such a tensor as lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and the second one is going to be quadratic in the components. So lambda 1, lambda 3, and the determinant is lambda 1, lambda 2 times lambda 3. Okay, so everything um, looks simpler for a symmetric tensor. Um, so we talked about um, a or, skew symmetric, for skew symmetric tensors, a particular quantity called the axial vector. Uh, let me also just mention that in passing. So if we have a skew symmetric tensor such that this transpose is equal to minus itself, it looks like a vector in the sense that we know it has three independent components. So why don't I define a vector such that when this tensor operates on some arbitrary vector v, the outcome is as though I have a vector, small w, crossing that vector the outcome of the right-hand side is a vector, this is a vector itself, itself and we're, what we're saying is that they're equal. And that implicitly defines what the so-called axial vector W of the skew symmetric tensor is. Um, so now, um, we're going to proceed now um, um, to another definition. And so that was a very compact review of, well, very compact and actually incomplete review of what we did last time. But let me move on and define what is a orthogonal tensor. Um, so a orthogonal tensor is not quite skew. It's not quite uh, symmetric, neither one. Um, but it is such that when you take its transpose, it is equal to inverse itself. Okay. And therefore, of course, it follows that Q transpose Q is equal to Q, Q transpose is equal to identity. And that is something that I am going to employ a lot. Okay. So either from the left or right, doesn't matter, you have Q transpose Q multiplication the outcome is an identity by the definition of an orthogonal tensor. Now, you can look at the determinant of uh, an ident uh, of, of, of a um, orthogonal tensor, and right. So, determinant of this is equal to one. Okay, determinant of Q transpose is equal to determinant of Q. So determinant of Q squared is equal to 1. Determinant of Q has to be either plus or minus 1, right? So those are the two options. So it's either 1, plus 1, or minus 1. If it is a plus 1, then it is called a proper orthogonal tensor. And if it's a minus 1, it's called an improper orthogonal tensor. Um, so, in a homework, you're going to show that um, a orthogonal tensor has at least one eigenvalue. Q. 
equals 1. Okay, that's a homework problem. Um, so that means that there exists a vector such that QA is equal to A. So, so let's say we have a proper orthogonal tensor, okay? Uh, first, I'd like to sort of slightly, we're not gonna, going to analyze, we could, we could really, uh, let me say, dedicate quite a bit of time to any of, most of the concepts we've covered so far, but in particular to such a tensor, because it has interesting properties. But um, eventually, let us look at that relation. So there's a Q, operates on a vector A, and the vector remains as it is, okay? So let me take three axes, and these axes sort of indicate uh, three basis vectors, orthonormal basis vectors, and this is a vector, the vector A, let's say. I don't really know uh, eventually what it, it, it could be in any direction, okay? Just for convenience, I'm drawing it from the uh, origin. So now it turns out that Q physically if it's a proper orthogonal tensor, physically it represents rotation, okay? So what it will do is it will take a vector, or in fact, it will take an object, and if this object has multiple, if you like, you can associate multiple vectors with this object. You can take this vector as one uh, reference vector for this object, that would be another vector, that would be another vector, right? And now you hit each of these vectors with a orthogonal tensor, okay? And then, once you know the new positions of these vectors, because it's just any tensor, when it hits a vector, it will change that vector, right? Uh, then you can redraw the object, right? Because you know where this vector goes, where that vector goes, where that vector goes, and you can that way reorient the object, okay? So what you will see is that it will rotate the object. That's what a orthogonal tensor does, if it is proper orthogonal, okay? Now, and for any rotation, it turns out that there is an axis of rotation. In other words, you can rotate the object in some fashion, but in going from here to there, you can always find an axis of rotation such that you can say that the object has actually rotated about that axis. Okay, so these are things we're not directly proving or going into detail, uh, but that's how the mathematics turns out. So now, this vector A, in other words, the vector that corresponds to the unit eigenvalue turns out to be that axis of rotation. So now, if you have an orthogonal tensor and it hits an object, you know that it's going to rotate it, let's say, right? And how do I know the axis of rotation? You just find the eigenvector that corresponds to an eigenvalue of one. So if that is the eigenvalue, eigen, eigenvector, right? And now, suppose you take any other vector, Let's say I take that vector, okay? So this is just a very qualitative drawing, right? So this is a reference vector. So now this is, since this is the axis of the rotation, right? Suppose now QV hits, Q hits V, and I get a new vector V prime. So because this is the axis of rotation, the vector will rotate about that axis of rotation depending amount, the amount of rotation. I don't know how much it will rotate, but perhaps this will be the new look of the vector, and that's the new vector V prime, okay? So that's what it does, okay? So a proper orthogonal tensor has this property, and intrinsically it turns out it corresponds to a physical rotation, okay? So that is a proper one. What if it's an improper one? It still somehow has to do with rotation, but a rotation that you possibly cannot physically obtain, okay? What could it be? Some simple operation like rotation, right? Very good, actually, intuition, yes, mirror, okay? So if you look yourself in the mirror, right, things are reversed. So it's a very simple transformation. What happens is that 
you turn inside out in some sense, right? So it's not something that you can physically obtain, but the operation is super simple, right? And it turns out that if you have an improper uh, orthogonal tensor, it has to do with some sort of a reflection. But that's not something you can obtain through a physical rotation in the 3D space, okay? So the types of rotations that we are going to be interested in uh, are proper, so physical rotations. So I will deal with, whenever we see an orthogonal tensor, Without exception, I can say it's going to be proper orthogonal. Okay. All right, good. So we have orthogonal tensor, right? And as usual, we're proceeding in some natural order. As soon as I have the concept of an orthogonal tensor, I can go ahead and define another useful, useful uh, um, result, which is called the polar decomposition. So for this purpose, I'm going to take any invertible tensor. And I'm going to pick, uh, for a very actually reason that is obvious to me, but not to you yet, I'm going to pick that tensor to be uh, F. And such a tensor, any invertible tensor, admits a particular decomposition. And in fact, it admits two decompositions. One of these will look like this. Okay. F equals V times R. And another one looks like this. F equals R U. And here, V and U are um, symmetric, positive, definite tensors, and R is orthogonal. Okay. If the determinant of F is somehow less than um, zero, right? This is symmetric positive definite, so determinant of these, V and U, they are both positive. So if this is a negative determinant, then R must be improper orthogonal, okay? Uh, eventually, we are interested in F that have positive determinants, and therefore R will be proper orthogonal. But in the statement itself, it doesn't necessarily, of course, have to be uh, proper. So now, uh, there is a, um, so, so as is common to many of the statements I made earlier, we're not proving these things. But let me highlight the significance of some of the issues here. So I'm writing F as the multiplication, multiplication of two particular tensors. Okay? One of them is orthogonal. The other one is symmetric positive definite. That's a very particular uh, expression or identification of these two tensors. Now, what you have to notice is that, of course, depending on which side the orthogonal tensor is, the other tensor is different. Okay? There is no reason why V and U have to be the same. So V is not equal to U. And indeed, I have indicated them to be two different tensors. However, um, you could also ask the following question. F admits a decomposition where on the left-hand side there is a symmetric positive definite tensor and an orthogonal tensor. Let me call this R1. Or it's the orthogonal tensor times the symmetric positive definite tensor. Let me call this R2. Why should R1 be equal to R2? Perhaps they are not, but it turns out they are. It's the same orthogonal tensor appearing in both decompositions. If you admit the existence of this expression, if you say this is R1 and R2, it's easy to show that actually R1 is equal to R2. Okay? But showing the decomposition itself would require a little bit more effort. Okay? So that's the significance of the uh, result. And these things have names. So just like in real life, you, we need to eventually know our left from our right. And unfortunately, this is something, honestly, I always forget because you rarely have to think about, at least I, the names of these things. So this is called the left polar decomposition. Okay? And 
the one on the the right is called the right polar decomposition. Okay, so. Of course, that's no easy way to remember. It's on the right, but you have to always remember, look at the expression and recall which one is right and which one is left. Unfortunately, it's not the side on which R appears. It's the side on which the orthogonal tensor itself appears, right? So on the left or on the right. So this naming will have consequences. We're going to eventually have tensors that are called left and right, depending on whether U or V implicitly appears in them. Um, any questions about the two boards? All right. Good. Now, um, we have our polar decomposition. We're going to certainly come back to it and make use of it. Now, now that we also, however, also have the orthogonal tensor, um, which, we, which helped us actually write down the polar decomposition, I want to immediately skip or move on to another issue, which is change of basis. So as I highlighted several times, so we're dealing with tensorial quantities. And all of these quantities are more than their components. They are the components together with the basis that you are referring to. And as I said multiple times, depending on your own particular choice of the basis, the way the tensorial quantity looks will, of course, be different. Okay? Um, now. Therefore, a natural question to ask is if I change the tans uh, basis from one set to another, and if I know the components with respect to one set, how do I transform the components to the new basis? Okay? So I have a basis. I know the components. I want to change the basis. How do the components themselves change with that variation of the basis? That's the question that we want to answer right now. Okay? And for this purpose, let me introduce two sets of orthonormal uh, basis vectors. And I'm going to call them EI and EI prime. And this discussion will also, on the side, will have a few um, remarks that will complement some of the things I said earlier. So this is going to be a new basis. This is an orthonormal one. This, eventually, I want it to be an orthonormal one as well. So I'm saying this in words. And so if both of them are right-handed bases, if this is orthonormal and the other one is an orthonormal, I have to be able to obtain one from the other through a rotation. And a rotation tensor is described by orthogonal tensor. And I'm going to assume that that tensor is Q. Okay. So of course, it applies in the same way to every basis vector. Okay, it rotates them simultaneously. So if you know the amount of rotation, and if you know your original basis, this is how you can calculate the uh, new basis. Now, sometimes what you'd like to do is the following. You have two sets of bases, actually, two sets of orthogonal tensors. Let's say one of them is this. And the other one is, the other one is, well, it's, it's unfortunate. OK, not a good idea, because that would be a left-handed one. OK, so one of them is this, and the other one is that. You know this basis and that basis. And what you'd like to find out is the amount of rotation that takes us from this to that. Okay? So if I know the rotation, I can go from one to the other. But if I am given the two sets of bases, that and that, what is the rotation involved? That's another question to ask, right? Uh, but that is a very easy question to answer. So Q is just like any tensor. It will have an expression as such with respect to one of the bases, let's say the old one. Um, and therefore, as I have shown you earlier, the components Q, M, N, is calculated by operating on one vector and then dotting with the other one. right? This is E n prime. And therefore, if you, if you know the two sets of basis vectors, and you would like to find out the amount of rotation that is involved, you simply 
take the dot product in combinations and you generate the rotation tensor components. Okay. Uh, so this is if EI prime is given. Okay. So either way, you know the old basis and the tensor, you know the new basis, or you know the two sets of bases, you can calculate the rotation tensor components, and now you know everything associated with this transformation in some sense. Okay. So now, let me, let me, before continuing with the basis change, where we're going to sort of uh, make use of these uh, quantities, expressions, let me dwell on the expression of this tensor Q. Now, Q has this expression with respect to the old basis. And if I put a prime there, it's the same tensor. But of course, because I pick a new basis, the components will be different. And we can call them Q prime mn. Okay? But in general, it is not a diagonal tensor or anything. It's just a tensor with all the components present. Okay? It's not symmetric. It's not anti-symmetric. It's not skew. It's just an orthogonal tensor. OK. Um, so now let me take this Q and operate on identity. It's still equal to Q. So why don't you have a look here for a second? Don't write. OK. So it's Q is QI. So I'm going to do a trick that I've done actually before. So instead of identity, I'm going to throw in the expression for the identity in terms of the old basis. And now you know that I can move this Q inside without changing anything. So it's QEI bond EI, but QEI is nothing but EI prime. Okay. So, okay, let me state the obvious. So if you want to write Q with respect to the one of the bases, let's say EM, EN, then the components go like that, okay, in the E i e j basis, okay. But if you would like to write Q, okay, the tensor in the in a basis in a tensorial basis that is composed of not one set of vectors but two sets of vectors, how does it look? So I, I, right? How does it look? Diagonal. It looks diagonal. Okay. So so, so this is the importance of you know not j just judging the tensor not only by the way its components look but by referring to its basis, right? Not everything that looks like an identity is an identity. Not everything that is symmetric is symmetric. Indeed, this is not symmetric. It's not identity. It's an orthogonal tensor. Okay. So this is one maybe concrete example at this stage to some of some some um, two remarks actually I made earlier referring to a combination of two sets of basis vector in generating a tensorial basis, OK? So all right, so these are subtleties, of course. Uh, of, often, often you prefer, in practice, for instance, when you do numerical calculations, not always, but often, uh, you prefer to pick the same tensor, the same set of vectors in generating your tensorial basis. You refer to the, the components with respect to that one. But of course, it's a matter of convenience. There is no reason why you should. Uh, why in the, this uh, EI prime uh, bump EJ, in the upper side, uh, EI prime bump EI? Uh, how can we change? So the question is? Uh, on EI prime bump EI, all the so here I have i and j, here I have i and i, because here there's a sum over i, and the components are 1, 1, 1. Here I have a components here which multiply 1, 2, 1, 3 as well, but components which multiply 1, 2, and 1, 3 are 0. 
right? They're zero anyway. So with respect to that basis, this is how it looks, which effectively is equivalent to that. Okay. Okay. So now, having sort of made that quick remark, let me move on to the change in the components. So again, I would prefer that as soon as you're done with that board, let's do this together once first, and then you can write it down. Okay. So I'd like to find out, I'd like to take a vector, and I know that if I ex express this vector, and here I'd like to always look at my notes, so that's because I've cleverly picked the indices to make some transitions smooth. I know that I like to, I can represent this vector with respect to one or the other basis. Okay? The components will differ. And now here my goal is to find out the relation between the primed and the unprimed components. Okay? How do I find this if I know those that set for instance? Okay? So let me start, therefore, with the, previous, the first expression. So that's equal to a i prime, e i prime. e i prime is nothing but the rotation of e i, right? So that is equal to okay, a i prime. Now I'm going to throw in the expression for q. And since here I have, sorry, I had an extra, yeah. Um, so since here I have the unprimed basis, I want to also express Q with respect to the unprimed basis, and I'm going to pick Q, M, N, E, M, E, N. So here I've done nothing so far, but start with the new expression, throw in the, um, the, the form of the new basis in terms of the old one, plug in the component representation sort of of the uh, rotation tensor. And then we go ahead and multiply, right? So it's going to be A prime I, Q, M, N, E, M, delta N, I. So I can go ahead and replace this N with I, the substitution property. And um, therefore, I have Q, M, I, A prime I, E, M. Okay. So now if you look, you have E, M there and EM there, so this must be equal to that. And that is essentially what I have found out. QMI A prime I must be equal to AM. Or, okay, so if I think of this as, so th these are the, this is the matrix Q, Q multiplying, right, the index is on the right hand side. So matrix Q multiplying the array, the components of A prime, which gives me the array, the components of the original vector A. So I have Q multiplying A prime is equal to A, or I can leave A prime by itself on the Left hand side, it's Q transpose A. So now the relation is significant because what we have is, let's put this here like this. So I have two sets of bases, EI and EI prime. And you go from one to the other through the rotation tensor A. Now, on the other hand, you have components with respect to the first basis, and you want to go to the components with respect to the second basis. And you operate not with Q, but in this case through 
Q transpose. Okay. Of course, these are nothing to memorize, but I'm just writing it down so that we can compare it with some other type of transformation soon. Okay, so please go ahead and write that much. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to compare this type of a transformation with something else which is going to co um, correspond to a physical rotation. So a physical rotation would be I take the vector A, a new vector A, and I obtain a new vector B which is going to be the rotation of A. Okay? And so now I can go ahead and express the components of the new vector with respect to the new basis. Let me first do that because it's going to show us something um, rather um, nice. Okay? Um, so that's B I E I prime, right? Now on the other hand, B is the rotation of A. So I can go ahead and write that as well. So B is equal to Q times A, and now I'm going to write A in terms of the old basis, okay? Right? Nothing fancy. Um, and now let me move on with that expression. It's going to be AI, Q operating on EI, but that is the new basis by definition, so that is equal to EI prime, okay? Um, and therefore, from these two, what I see is that bi prime is equal to ei prime. Sorry, bi prime is equal to ai. Okay. What does that mean physically? Well, it means actually something quite uh, simple. Suppose I have a basis, right? And the basis is transformed to a prime basis through a rotation. On the other hand, I have a vector. And the vector is transformed into another vector through a rotation. Now, if the rotations are the same, as the vector is transformed, so is the basis. And the components of the basis with respect to the rota the components of the vector with respect to this rotating basis always remains the same. That's what this expression tells us. Now, on the other hand, of course, if you keep the basis the same, if you want to always refer to the original basis and you rotate the vector alone, then of course, its components with respect to the original basis is going to transform, okay? So let's see how that works out, okay? So, so this says that uh, components with respect to rotating basis do not change. Okay? But if I'd like to find the components with respect to the original basis, and now I'm going to refer to the original unprimed basis, and now I'd like to find how BM changes. Okay? And Again, B, that's, this is now the, another alternative expression for B, but B is again Q times A. But now I'm going to write down everything in terms of the old basis. So Q is EM bond EN, and A is equal to AI EI, right? Okay. And I know the outcome of this expression, so it's going to be QMI AIEM. Okay? And therefore, BM must be equal to this quantity here. Okay? 
So BM is equal to QMI AI. Okay. Or if you like, B, the components of the vector with respect to the original basis is the components of the rotation tensor with respect to the same basis times the components of A. Okay, B is equal to QA. So now if I put these results together, uh, and make a summary that resembles the board on the left-hand side, That's our summary. So if it's just a change of basis and the vector itself is not changing, so that's the board on the left-hand side, right? Uh, you rotate your basis, and the vector is the same, and therefore the components transform with a Q transpose, whereas if the vector itself is also transforming with the rotation, you rotate the basis, and the components of this new vector also transform with the same rotation, Q. Okay. That, would be, um, that would be a summary. So the reason I'm highlighting this is because it is always important whether the quantity we're looking at is just associated with a change of basis. So the vector components is changing. Is it due to? change of basis, or is it a physical rotation? We have to be able to distinguish between the two. And in some sense, by looking at the transformation, you can make this, um, you, can, you can find out or recognize what the particular change represents. So let me write down this expression because it is important. So it's important to distinguish uh, between, let's say, change of basis. So when you change the basis, what you're doing is, in some sense, mathematically reinterpreting the quantity. The vector itself is the same. It's a certain, let's say, velocity vector of a certain object. The velocity is not changing. It's still the same vector. What is changing is you're changing your interpretation because the basis is changing. On the other hand, if the object is rotating, let's say, and its position coordinates uh, somehow are changed, then what is happening is that the physics is somehow causing that change. The object is moving, it's physically rotating, etc. So that would be a change in perceived physics. Bir iki saniye ara alacağım, pardon. Çünkü bu şeyin açık olduğunu şimdi fark ettim ve burası çok sıcak. It's too hot here. I'm turning this off. Okay. Tamam, burayı keseriz. Because I'm starting to sweat in front of the board. I don't know about you guys. All right. Um, So rotations are going to appear again and again. And I'm going to refer back to, uh, actually, these two items here very shortly when we start the actual content of continuum mechanics, where we start talking about kinematics, about when, when, when we talk about motion, why it's important to be able to distinguish between change in perceived physics and change in interpretation, and whether one can do that, actually. Um, so um, that, would be, that would be a philosophical remark. Um, and we're going to come to those topics actually next week. Uh, OK, so now um, this, of course, is not the whole story. Because if you're talking about change in um, physics, or, or the physics itself causing an object to somehow um, 
alter its properties or whether you're changing the coordinates, we could do the same discussion for tensors, not only vectors. Okay? And this is a homework problem, but let me go ahead and write down the um, major results. And you will have a chance to carry out the details as a homework problem. So for tensors, one can do the same type of thing. First, you can have a change of basis, which means you're going to take a tensor A and it can have a representation A, I, J, E, I, bond E, J with respect to the original basis. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to change the basis with to the primed one and find out the primed components of this uh, tensor. And it turns out that when you want to do that, the primed components have to do with such a transformation. So it's Q transpose AQ. Or if you like, in terms of components, um, A prime IJ would be equal to Q transpose IK, AKL, QL, um, J. And since the basis here, I'm assuming for both components, they are composed of the same set of vectors, I can here simply write QKI, AKL, QLJ. Okay. And as a, as, a, as a tiny exercise for recalling certain conventions, I here see, for instance, a matrix multiplying another one. The dummy index appears on the left-hand side, so this must be Q transpose A. Okay. This is, it's good to keep these conventions in mind because it's a simple way of checking whether my calculations are carried out correctly. Okay. Um, so that would be a change of the basis. Now on the other hand, what you can is or have is also a rotation. Now I'm going to interpret very shortly um, such a transformation to be the rotation of the tensor A. Okay. So I understand easily what, for a, for a vector, what it means to transform. But for, an, for a, for a uh, tensor, again, this can be interpreted as a rotation in several ways. Actually, I'm just going to give you one interpretation. But if you do that transformation, so now this is not the same tensor anymore. This is the same tensor. It's just two different bases, and hence two different sets of components. But this is now a new tensor. Okay? There's a physical transformation. And now if I'd like to find the components of B, the way you do that is not through Q transpose, but first Q, and then A, and then Q transpose. It's a difference that is similar qualitatively to the vectorial transformation. And in terms of components, then you can go ahead and write Q, I, M, A, M, N, Q, and J, transpose, or Q, I, M, A, M, N, Q, J, N. Again, what you can do, do is you can do a quick check of your calculations. I have QA, Q transpose, transpose is on the right-hand side. The free, the dummy index is on the side of the transpose, on the right-hand side. This is how I can check index-wise the correctness of this or the uh, meaningfulness of that expression. Okay, I can still make an index uh, mistake with the indices, of course, but at least uh, the transpose is represented correctly. Okay. Now, what I'd like to quickly do is interpret this thing 
as a rotation. And the interpretation, one of several perhaps, but the one I will choose is the following. I have A, the tensor, um, operating on an arbitrary vector, small a, and it will send me to B. Okay? So this is A tensor, this is some vector, and there will for sure be a uh, influence on A, so I get a new vector. Okay? Nothing fancy there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to operate on both sides with the rotation tensor, Q. Okay? Since the blue is my given, okay, I have the tensor, I pick any vector, I get some new vector, and now I'm operating on two sides with the same rotation, so the equality still holds. Okay? So, and if I do this now, now that's the next step, let's again put a different color. I'm going to throw in here an identity. So if I throw in an identity, absolutely nothing changes. And I know that identity can be expressed as Q transpose Q because Q is a orthogonal tensor. And hence, now what I can do is a sh quick grouping, which will read, actually let's do that in blue, uh, Q A Q transpose multiplying Q A is equal to QB. So here I have the first expression, and here I have the second expression. Okay? And the interpretation is as follows. A is a tensor that takes a vector, sends it to another vector. If I want to send the rotation of the vector to the rotation of the other vector, then I must throw in the rotation of A. Okay? So A, Q, A, Q transpose, which is B, is the rotation of the original tensor A in the sense that it sends the rotation of small a, the vector A, to the rotation of B. That's the interpretation. So now, uh, we've been doing some tensor algebra, so we are going to move to the last part of the mathematical preliminaries where we start talking about uh, tensor calculus. Okay, and we're going to recall again several results that you already know, but also going to introduce some uh, going to introduce some notation as well. OK, so I'm going to throw roughly a, let's say, a coordinate system. And um, we will always be interested in a domain. And the domain will physically represent some object. Okay. Okay. That's my object. Has some uh, three-dimensional um, structure. And eventually, I'd like to refer to the points that lie in or on the object. And I'm going to presently indicate that with a small x. And um, the point I'm referring to, let's say, is p. Okay? Now, the domain itself, I will refer to as presently d. And the domain will also have a boundary. And I'm always going to use the partial sign to refer to the boundary of a domain so that uh, 
so that I know the boundary it's associated with automatically. Okay. And in this case, the boundary, of course, is a surface. Okay. In 2D, it would be a line. In 1D, it would be a set of two points, etc. Um, and uh, for present purposes, I will introduce a vector that points outwards on the boundary at any point, and it is of unit magnitude. And I will denote that vector with n. So it's our outward unit normal. And now within this domain, I'm going to define some functions, or I'm going to be interested in quantities that are defined in that domain, let's say. And I will simply refer to them as functions. Uh, and these functions could be scalar functions, vector functions, or tensor functions. Okay? So let me indicate them with phi, v, or t. In every case, the function depends not only on the position within the domain, but at a given position on time. Okay? So for instance, uh, just a second ago, I turned off the uh, air conditioner because it was too hot, right? The air conditioner is blowing air into the room. Okay? And so initially the room is cold, let's say, and your air conditioner starts working, and it starts to heat up the room, right? So first of all, if you're sitting at any location, you will feel that the temperature at the point, at your point of location, at your location is increasing, so it changes with time. But at any given time, if you're closer to the air conditioner, then it's going to be warmer than far away from the air conditioner. So there's for sure a dependence on position as well. The air conditioner introduces an air velocity. You're going to feel it stronger if you're closer and less if you're far away. And when it starts, it blows very fast and then it slows down perhaps, so it depends on time as well. And when the air flows, it introduces shear stresses, et cetera, in the, 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 uh, in the air that's contained in this room. And that has to do with the stress tensor. So stress turns out to be a tensor, which likewise will depend on position and time. So this, a good example for this would be velocity. And a good example for this would be the stress field that forms within the, uh, within the room. OK, so by making use of these three functions and this domain, I'm going to recall, we're going to recall together some operations. And the first operation is the gradient operation. When what it does is it takes a tensorial quantity and tensor level wise, it will send it one level up. So I'm going to here write one tensor level up. So it sends a quantity one tensor level up in the following sense. Um, so there are, as you know, several ways of um, writing down the gradient. So on a scalar function, perhaps this is the most common one. But I'm going to sometimes write it like this. In fact, this is the one that I will prefer. And you will see why, okay? because there will be different types of gradients referring to different types of domains. Or I will prefer explicitly to the position coordinates or the position vector that I'm taking a gradient with respect to. Okay, so of course I can always write this as a uh, in terms of its components and bases because a gradient takes a scalar and sends it one tensor level up, which is a vector, and it has components del phi del xi, and the basis is. EI. Okay. Again, yet another compact way that we can write this in is phi comma i EI. Okay. These are all equivalent expressions of the same operation. Now, the gradient can have theta vector. Um, the it can also be expressed 
explicitly as a graph, and that would be del V del X. And in terms of components, okay, so we can settle this once and for all. The way you go in order is from top to bottom. So if you want to write down the components with respect to a basis EI, BAN, EJ, I belongs to the upper part, so it's VI, and J belongs to the lower part. So it's del VI, del XJ, okay? So more compactly, you can write VI, comma, J, EI, BAN, EJ. So from a vector in this case, we go one level up towards a tensor. So now what you can do is you can also take the gradient of a tensor. And that would be gradient t. So then we would have del t del x. And the basis is going to be now, this is perhaps our first encounter with a third order tensor. So second order. The tensorial basis, if you like, of the upper object and continue with the tensorial basis of the lower object, which in this case is the position vector, and attach the components going from top to bottom. So it's del T i j del x k. Okay? And more compactly, you could write T i j comma k e i bon e j bon e k. So in this case, we start with a second order tensor the gradient sends us one level up to a third order tensor. Now clearly, as since you can move one tensor level up across the ladder of tensorial quantities, you can also move down. And the operator that lets us do that would be the divergence operator. One tensor level down. And if you're at the bottom of the ladder, that will be a scalar, uh, you cannot go any further down. So the uh, lowest you can operate on would be a vector. And for a vector, um, we, would have, we will have divergence defined. Now, the thing is, the way these things go is um, you first define, let's say, the gradient, right? And you try to define the other objects uh, somehow in terms of something you already know. So divergence is going to be defined in terms of uh, the gradient. And it's defined as the trace of the gradient of the vector v. Here I just dropped the brackets for clarity. Or if you want, we can always put it in at this stage. We're at the beginning. Okay. That's how you will see it expressed in the notes. So that's the definition of the uh, gradient. Okay. Now, if you work out the components, so gradient of V is a tensor, and it has components i, j. And when you take the trace of a tensor, you sum the diagonal one, so it becomes not i, j, i, i. So it's going to be del V, i over del x, i. Okay. That is the divergence. And of course, you can write it compactly, V, i, comma, um, so what you can also do is, and that's another notation, you can think of the gradient as a vector with so, sort of, it's, it's a vector because I've written it as such, okay? Uh, although the components look funny, but now if you want to write the divergence of V simply as that vector dotted with uh, the vector that it operates on, okay? That would be a nice compact rotation that, of course, you often see and which I myself uh, also sometimes prefer, but not in this course. So for a tensor, we can also do the divergence. Um, so now that we know, right, again, it's an order. I knew the gradient, so I defined the divergence of a vector. So now I'd like to def define the divergence of a tensor. And to make that meaningful, I'm going to refer implicitly to the divergence of a vector. I'm going to make use of that definition. And the way we're going to do that is as follows. If I take a tensor and take its divergence, I expect a quantity that is one tensorial level less, so it would be a vector. And I can take the dot product of a vector with another vector. That vector is arbitrary, any vector A. Okay? And now the divergence of T is such that the outcome is 
I defined divergence to be such that the outcome is divergence of this vector for any choice of A that is uh, not 0. Okay? In fact, not 0, but I don't want to be a I, want, I don't want A to be a position dependent vector. It's just a constant vector, but any constant vector. That's the intrinsic definition, right? So similarly, this is the intrinsic definition of divergence. This is the explicit or extrinsic one. Likewise, this is the intrinsic definition of divergence of a tensor in this case. Um, let me work out the details so that we can obtain the component representation of the divergence operator. Um, so now this is a vector t. Okay. Okay. And this is a tensor operating on A through its transpose. Okay. So if I want to refer to a basis EI, then it's going to be T, the Dummy index is going to be on the side of the transpose, so free index is going to be on the right, A, K. Okay. Without a transpose, it would have been T, I, K, A, K, right? Okay, so that is what lies in uh, the divergence. So uh, this is equal to, let's say, T, K, E, K. Uh, and now I'm going to go ahead and take the divergence of the object that lies in here, which is going to be T, K, I, A, K, comma, I, right? I have a vector. The vector has components T, K, A. A, K, so the free index is I, and the divergence of a vector is such that that free index is repeated with a comma afterwards, so it takes a partial derivative. So I, comma, I. Okay. Um, so on the other hand, A, K is a constant by definition, so it comes out of this derivative, so it's equal to T, K, I, A, K. All right. Good. Let me write this a bit more compactly. So I worked on the right hand side. Now I will work on the left hand side. So I have a vector dotted with another vector. Components T, K, A, K will be the result. And then I look and compare. There is an A, K here and an A, K there. And therefore, these must be the same. Okay. So the components of the vector divergence of T is that. Okay. So divergence of T is equal to T K I comma I E K. Now you can pick the indices of course to be anything you like, if you like. T I J comma J E I would also be an equivalent representation. Or you can write this, of course, explicitly as such. Um, these definitions you have to recall. When you want to, if you have to write down the divergence of a tensor, you immediately need to be able to. But don't worry, because we're going to practice with it many times, you will eventually um, <laughs> learn how to do that. Um, if you want to refer to the expression for the gradients, if that's going to help, if you like to take the divergence of a vector, so that is the trace of the gradient, it becomes ii. 
For a tensor, there is an i, j, k. You do the trace, if you like, on the second index. So it becomes i, j, j. That would be the divergence of t versus the gradient of t. Okay. So there is some sort of a trace involved, but if you need to do it on the correct index. Again, it's always important to remember that there are different definitions of these operators. So for instance, you can open up a book and you can see that in that book, divergence is defined as del t i j comma x i. Okay? And the basis would in that case be e j. But the trace is not on the second one, but on the first index. Okay? As long as you make a definition and you use it consistently throughout, it's all right. Okay? These are choices of the authors. Okay? This is a common choice that you will see. Perhaps more common than the other one. Um, all right, so now we're moving up and down on the ladder of tensorial quantities. Gradient sends us up, divergence sends us down. What we can do is we can remain at the same tensorial level. That would be a curl, right? Now, you can take the curl of a vector, it will send you to a vector. And that's an operation that you have, of course, seen before. But perhaps you have never seen the curl of a tensor, or for that matter, a matrix. So if you take the curl of a tensor, it will send you to another tensor. Okay? And there are applications when you, where you see that in solid mechanics, for instance. But in this course, we will not need it. Okay, I'm just going to define the curl. Uh, in fact, I cannot immediately recall whether we're going to, in fact, use the curl or not. But since we've defined divergence and gradient, uh, let me also define this one. So same tensor level. And I'm going to only do it for a, um, for a vector. And it's defined in terms of, again, the divergence implicitly. So I'd like to take the curl of a vector v. And in order to define it implicitly, I throw in a random vector, a constant vector a. That's a vector. I can take its dot with another vector. And it's going to be such that, according to my definition, it's going to be the divergence of v cross a. Here, v is some position-dependent vector. a is a constant one. For every a, constant. Um, so just, just for reference, for instance, you could define the curl of a tensor implicitly now in terms of the curl of a vector. Once you know what this is, it's defined like this in terms of divergence. So now I know what the curl of a vector means. And I can make use of that in defining the curl of a tensor, just like I did for the divergence for a tensor. I did it in terms of the divergence of a vector. And it is as follows. The curl of a tensor, it's again a tensor. And it, when it acts on a vector, now this is a vector. And it has to be equal to another vector, which is the curl of, actually very, very similar to the definition of a divergence. That would be how it's defined. So that's a vector. Curl of a vector is a vector. That's a vector itself. Right? So this one I understand because now I have an intrinsic definition for it, and which allows me now to define what the tensorial curl is. Okay. Uh, so let me work out this one in components. Why don't you have a look for a second, because then we're done. Um, and here, there are some indices floating around. So let me be careful while doing this. So this is a vector. Let me call it c. Okay? I'm going to follow steps that are very similar to those that we followed for the divergence. And on the right-hand side, I have an operation that I understand quite well. It is the divergence of a vector product. And we, uh, our choice of the order of the indices was ij, ij, and then the basis ek. Okay? So now, this is a vector, right? The basis is ek, and therefore, these are the components of the vector 
d. Okay? So the divergence of a vector in terms of components is nothing but dk, comma k. Okay? So you can always make these sub-definitions to make the transitions clear to yourself, but after a while you will not read it. As soon as you see this and you see the divergence and basis ek, you will immediately write comma k over there. So let me carry out the substitution now. What lies for dk is eijk vi aj, and now there is a comma k, the basis is gone. And eijk is a constant, aj is a constant, so what only remains is vi comma k aj. Good. Now, on the other hand, this is a tensor, a vector, sorry, cj ej. All right. Um, and if I dot it with a vector a, it's going to be cj aj. And you notice that I am picking the indices cleverly so that aj is shared, and therefore what I have here must be equal to what I have over here. And that allows me to conclude the expression for the curl of V. The curl of V is a vector C such that its components look like this. Or putting everything together with the basis, the curl of V is a vector Cj Ej is equal to, with components Cj, Eijk Vi comma k, ej. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to reorder the uh, permutation simple for a reason so that I can put it in the form of a cross product. This is our preferred order, so I immediately recognize the cross product. The first two indices refer to sum over the basis components of the vectors, right? So I want to reorder these. I see an i and a k, I want to have an i and a k. Uh, somehow over here, okay? Um, so EIJK, I'm going to do one smooch between J and I. That introduces a minus sign. And if I do one more switch, another minus sign, so that makes the plus EJKI, okay? Um, so that is now equal to EJKI del over, so now I'm writing the partial derivative separately so it looks like the basis of the gradient vector, vi ej, okay? Okay. Good. And you can now recognize by comparing these expressions, or for that matter, if you can immediately go back and look at our definition of a cross product, that this is equal to curl of, or gradient operator, cross the vector v. Okay, okay. so this is in fact the definition that you see, and then you can derive the component representation. Uh, what I've done is I've chosen a implicit intrinsic definition, and I've shown that it can be alternatively expressed like this. Okay? Um, curl is not, as I said, something that we're going to use often, but then again, uh, it's fair and meaningful to um, discuss it at this stage. Okay? Questions? Yeah? Um, I just missed that on the left hand side. How did we, we said C is equal to CJ EJ, and then right after that, we said C is equal to CJ EJ. I just missed that part of So this is a vector, components basis, and C dotted with A is equal to that. Right? OK. No. Uh, the second part, when we said EIJK is a constant, but it, it, I can see the K indices in there. How is it a constant with respect to K? Um, so that is a minus or plus 1 or 0, it depends on K, right? It does, it does. But when I take partial derivatives with respect to k, it means I'm taking it that it's position dependent. So E is not position dependent. 
it only depends on the values. But after all, at any given position, depending on i, j, k, it is equal to plus, minus, or 0. Plus 1, minus 1, or 0. So it's not position dependent, should be perhaps a better wording. Uh, also, since we said that the curl uh, takes the set, keeps the set in the right. or the object on the same curl, can we define it for a scalar value? <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so let me see. I, mean, uh, I don't see why we would we do that. I don't know if it's used in anywhere, but. Right, right, right. So you, so, so, uh, the, the, okay. So perhaps there is a fancy definition, but uh, so the reason why we cannot really take the divergence is we can always take the derivative, but as soon as I take a scalar and introduce a derivative, then it somehow is referring to now the components of a vector. So now because I see a free index, phi comma i, that's like the components of a vector. Indeed, that's the component of a gradient vector. So you can, okay, I'm going to give an answer that I don't want to say no, okay? So I'm going to give an answer that is, uh, that is uh, sort of goes around. And I'm going to say it like this. Suppose I have a divergence, right? I can take a scalar and I can define a vector in terms of the scalar and then I can go ahead and take its divergence. Okay, so now you have a divergence for a scalar, but really it's not the divergence of a scalar, but divergence of an intermediate vector. Okay, but I don't define directly the divergence of the scalar. So similarly, I cannot directly do the curl of a scalar uh, unless perhaps through some fancy way or uh, abstract way, but I can always construct a vector and then carry out its curl. Uh, maybe that's A. No answer that doesn't look like a no. <laughs> OK, a question. But that's, that's a zero, right? Because uh, the divergence, the curl of a divergence is zero. The same vector. Oh, that's, um, so, so, no, no. Um, right, so if you take the curl of a gradient, yeah, that's true. But you can do it. Questions? All right. So if not, we're almost done with the mathematical preliminary. So actually, next time, we are going to start with uh, some uh, continuum mechanics concept. But let me highlight, of course, we're going to make thorough use of everything we've done in the past three weeks. So if there is anything that you are not fully comfortable with, uh, the upcoming weeks will let you practice with those, certainly, but it's a good time to stop and ask yourself if you have questions, come over. We can discuss those, right? All right, see you next time.